Hello everyone. So in this video, I'd like to talk to you about a drawback of the IRR decision rule, which is that in some situations, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute, but in certain situations, you can have investments which have multiple IRRs. So what I mean is that you may very well have an investment in which the IRR is not just one number, but you may have one IRR, which is say equal to 10%. And then you may have another IRR, which is, uh, let's suppose, equal to, uh, I don't know, 50%. Um, so let's suppose that, let's suppose for some reason that you do end up with an investment in which you have these two IRRs. Well, that's a problem, right? Because how do you make a decision based on the uh, IRR rule? The IRR rule says that, look, you should invest in a project, in an investment, if the IRR is greater than the discount rate. Now, let's suppose that your discount rate is 25%. Well, now what do you do? On the one hand, you have this IRR where 10% is less than 25%. So if you use this IRR and compare it to your required rate of return or your discount rate, this would actually tell you to reject. On the other hand, if you used the second IRR, which is 50%, well, 50% is more than 25%. So in this case, in, in this particular IRR, I would say, well, what are you doing? You should accept. And so now what do you do? Reject or accept? You don't know. So unfortunately, in this sort of a situation, um, you can't really rely on the IRR rule because you're getting sort of conflicting uh, conclusions about whether this is a worthwhile investment or not. Now, you might ask, well, under what circumstances may I get uh, multiple IRRs? So mind you, this will only happen with projects with unconventional cash flows. Recall what are projects with conventional cash flows. Conventional cash flows, and we've talked about this in a previous video, Conventional cash flow projects are the type in which, uh, let's draw this timeline, in which you have some cash outflow happening here, right? So money is going out as depicted by this negative sign. And then you receive some funds, receive funds. In fact, with conventional cash flows, after one single outflow, you just receive inflows, right? That's conventional cash flows. An example of an unconventional cash flow would be when you have some outflow, you get some inflows, but then let's suppose towards the very end, you have to make another outflow. So this is a uh, typical of situation where investments are the kind of like, let's suppose you, I don't know, invested in a nuclear power plant and uh, up over here, you did some economic activity, did some electricity generation and all that. And now you're closing the f plant and towards the end, you have to spend a whole lot of money. Like uh, these are called abandonment costs in which you have to clear a lot of like nuclear waste and all that. So my point is that towards the end of the project, you may have a whole lot of outflow happening. Okay, so this is an example of unconventional cash flow. Why? Because you're spending up front and then you're also spending some money towards the end. So it's not just one outflow followed by just inflows. There's an additional outflow happening. It turns out that when there's a situation like this, when you have outflows followed by inflows followed by outflows, you can have multiple IRRs. In fact, generally, and this is, this is not exactly true, but generally this is the rule the number of times the cash flows switch signs is the number of IRRs that you tend to have uh, for a project. Again, I am not being exactly technically correct. There, there are some exceptions to this, but, but I don't want to get into the details of that. But more generally, this is, the, again, this is the rule, more generally that the number of times your cash flows are switching signs is the number of IRRs that you tend to have for a project. So here, for example, you have one negative. You're going from a negative to a positive. Okay, so that's one sign switch. Okay, so that's one. We are going from positive to a positive. Is that a sign switch? No. Okay, so nothing here. And then you're going from a positive to a negative. That's a sign switch here, right? positive to negative. That's another. So here you will have uh, possibly two IRRs. So IRR1 and IRR2. Uh, and so that's the problem. Now, again, I, I should warn you that this is not technically exactly right. Um, there are some sort of footnoteish. Uh, comments that I can make over here. But anyway, this is the general rule. So in this case, you'll get two IRRs. In fact, if I extended this timeline 
and said that in time period four, that hypothetically speaking, you were going to get another cash inflow, that would mean that you'd be getting another sign switch going from a negative to a positive this time. That would be three, so you could potentially have three IRRs in this sort of an investment. So when this happens, when you have unconventional cash flows like this, then unfortunately you cannot rely on the IRR rule. However, who will come to the rescue? Turns out NPV because NPV says, hey, no problem, no problem. You know, just tell me what your discount rate is, K. So K is my symbol for discount rate. And all that I'm going to do, buddy, is I'm going to take the first cash flow. Okay, take that as it is. Let's take the second inflow. I'm going to discount that at my discount rate. I'm going to take the second inflow divided by my one plus the discount rate and square it. So K is any discount rate, 5, 10, 15, whatever. And then C3, this is a negative, right? The NPV says no problem, just subtract it. Take this negative, divide by one plus K and do the Q cube. And then, oh, you have another inflow? No problem. Take that and divide by one plus K raised to the power four. NPV rule says, baby, bring it on. Inflows, outflows, I don't care because what I really care about is that in the end, is the answer greater or less than zero? If the net answer comes out to be greater than zero, you make this investment. And if it's not, you don't. That's as simple as it is. So that's the nice thing about NPV. NPV says, you know, my decision rule doesn't really depend on inflows and outflows. I just look at the net number. But unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to use the IRR decision rule reliably in this sort of a situation because there are too many IRRs. Now, you might ask, well, how can I go about computing these different IRRs for a project like this? And that's a whole different video I'll probably make for you. Uh, but um, turns out that you can use Excel to do this. Um, you cannot do it on your financial calculators. But anyway, even if you could calculate these IRRs, the point still stands you can't use those IRRs reliably in most situations to make a decision because one IRR could tell you to reject and another could tell you to accept. So in a situation like this, go with NPV. The one last point that I want to make over here is that look, this issue of multiple IRRs is only happening because of these sign switches. But notice that when we were talking about conventional cash flows, where you had a negative number followed by all positive. So let me take this away. Let me sort of erase this. So let's suppose that this weren't here, which means that now this, uh, there won't be any sign switch here. There wouldn't be any sign switch here as well. In fact, now if you look at this timeline, look, the only sign switch that is happening, and this notice that this is conventional cash flows, the only time the uh, sign is changing is when you're going from the first outflow to this inflow. After that, it's all a series of positives, positives, positives. In this case, there is only one sign switch, which means that there would only be one singular IRR. And so that is why we did not have this issue with IRR before, because with conventional cash flows, fortunately, you're just going to have one sign switch one IRR and so you can reliably make a decision using IRR as well as NPV but with multiple IRRs don't go with IRR go with NPV